Last time we talked about the retreat doctrine. An actor is sometimes privileged to use deadly force, even though the use of deadly force is unnecessary. This time our topic is the aggressor doctrine. According to this doctrine, also called provocation doctrine, an actor is sometimes not privileged to use deadly force, even though it is necessary to defend herself. Recall how self-defense as an affirmative defense operates. The defendant wants to widen the context for the fact finder to include facts about the victim's conduct as perceived by the defendant. But the prosecution can also widen the context by showing that the defendant created the need to use force. Where that happens, the defendant can be deprived of what otherwise might be a viable defense. This is the so-called aggressor doctrine, and we see it in play in the case of U.S. versus Peterson. Peterson saw Kite stealing windshield wipers from Peterson's wrecked car parked in the back of his house. Peterson went outside and objected. After a verbal exchange with Kite, Peterson went back inside and then returned with a gun. Kite by then was seated in his own car and was about to depart. If you move, Peterson shouted to Kite, I will shoot. Kite got out of his car and advanced on Peterson with a lug wrench in his hand. When Kite failed to maintain social distance, Peterson shot him dead. Peterson appeals from his manslaughter conviction, complaining that he was denied a jury instruction on self-defense. His conviction is affirmed. In the court's opinion, the right of homicidal self-defense is denied to slayers who incite the fatal attack, encourage the fatal quarrel, or otherwise promote the necessitous occasion for taking life. Those who incite, encourage, or promote an affray are not entitled to a jury instruction on self-defense. Notice that the court, rather than the jury, makes the determination whether the defendant was a provoker. The result seems harsh. Didn't Kite start it? Wasn't Kite the provoker? The court writes, The fact that the deceased struck the first blow, fired the first shot, or made the first menacing gesture does not legalize the self-defense claim if, in fact, the claimant was the actual provoker. But how does the court decide that Peterson was the actual provoker rather than Kite? The court suggests an analogy to the Laney case. In Laney, the defendant was chased by an angry mob. Laney escaped, but chose to return to a place where, in the court's words, he had every reason to believe that his presence would provoke trouble. Laney exchanged fire with his assailants, and one was killed. Laney was denied an instruction on self-defense, and so too is Peterson. The model penal code formulation is interestingly different. It states, Deadly force is not justifiable if the actor, with the purpose of causing death or serious bodily harm, provoked the use of deadly force against himself in the same encounter. The defendant who uses deadly force cannot raise this defense of self-defense if he is a provoker. But notice that the court must be persuaded that it, that it was the defendant's purpose to use deadly force and manufactured a pretext by provoking the, the victim. Query whether the model penal code doctrine would have denied Laney a self-defense instruction. Laney was counted as the actual provoker because he had every reason to know his return to the street would cause trouble. The model penal code speaks of purpose rather than mere knowledge and strips the defendant of his right to raise self-defense only if it was his purpose to create a pretext for using deadly force. Mere knowledge suffices under Peterson and Laney. There is another respect in which the model penal code seems to widen the availability of the defense of self-defense. We all know from experience, including television and movies, that often disputes start small, flare up, and escalate, sometimes leading to a fatal outcome. Under Peterson, it takes more than mere words to constitute a provocation. 
there must be some provocative act. Yet simply being in a place the actor might lawfully be can make one a provoker if one knows one's presence will cause violence. The only way a provoker can recover the privilege of using deadly self-defensive force is by withdrawing. But what if the provoker cannot withdraw? The model penal code notes this kind of situation. A attacks B with his fists. B defends himself and subdues A, pinning him to the floor. B then starts to batter A's head savagely against the floor. A manages to rise, and since B is still attacking him, and A now fears that if he is thrown again to the floor he will be killed, A uses a knife. B is killed or seriously wounded. A's initial non-deadly attack makes A the provoker. Under Peterson, A has lost his right of self-defense. A has gone beyond mere words. The only way A can recover the right to defend himself with deadly force is by withdrawing. But withdrawal is not an option here. A is under deadly attack by B. Under Peterson, A is not entitled to a self-defense instruction. The model penal code intends a different result. A is, of course, criminally liable for his initial battery on B, but would have, would have a justifying defense for the ultimate homicide unless A entered the encounter with the purpose of causing death or serious bodily harm. B was justified in resisting A's unlawful non-deadly force with non-deadly force. B went beyond that and is using deadly force. B's escalation of the level of violence restores A's right to defend with deadly force, but A remains unjustified in the initial battery. Fact patterns can become complicated. It helps to work through them carefully. In the meantime, shelter in place and stay safe.